looking at a section in Mark chapter number two, and that last hymn and re is really the the message that I have uh, on my heart, our need for the Lord Jesus. And uh, I suppose if you don't take anything else away, then that would really be a very apt summary of the message uh, today. Uh, the need for the Lord Jesus. Do we feel that need? So Mark chapter 2, please, and verse number 13. Mark 2 and verse number 13. And speaking about the Lord Jesus, it says, And he went forth again by the seaside. And all the multitude resorted to him, and he taught them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the receipt of custom. And he said to him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. And it came to pass that as Jesus sat at meat in his house, Levi's house, many publicans, that's tax collectors, and sinners sat also together with Jesus and his disciples. For there were many, and they followed him. And when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eat with publicans and sinners, they said to his disciples, How is it that he eateth and drinketh with publicans and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he saith to them, They that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. They that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. Let's ask for God's help, shall we? Our Father, we do come again into thy presence with thanksgiving. We thank thee for the word of God and we remember that it is living and powerful and it's thy word by thy spirit that's able to speak to us. So we really depend upon thyself this afternoon. Each of us has a deep need of the Lord Jesus. Um, there may be some who have never started a path of faith. We commit them to thee, our Father, for a special work of thy Holy Spirit. Others, our Father, have perhaps walked the path of faith for many years, uh, but all of us, irrespective of where we are, we need the Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, our Father, that he alone uh, has the words of eternal life. It's he alone, our Father, that made us, and one day we will stand before him, and he alone, our Father, is the way into and the door uh, through into heaven. And so, our Father, we pray that as we would share something of the Lord Jesus this afternoon, that each heart and soul would be blessed and encourage. So be with us, our Father, we pray, as we ask our Father for it, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, over the last year or so, we have had the privilege of sending out invitations to weddings, and some of you might be at that stage yourself, and usually it has your name on it. And here, there's invitations, in a sense, have gone out to a meeting, and not a wedding feast as such, but uh, a very special meeting where the Lord Jesus Christ was present, and if you were privileged enough to get such an invitation on it, it would invite you in two ways. You'd either be invited to that meal with the Lord Jesus and on it would say sinner. Uh, or it just might say traitor. And either of those would give you access into that, uh, that, into that setting. You might not be too pleased, of course, of receiving such an invitation uh, of uh, sinner or traitor. But nonetheless, that picture we have in Mark chapter 2 is exactly that. You've got people called publicans, maybe just a word of explanation. Publicans were tax collectors. And today, tax collectors, well, they're not quite the same as the tax collectors in Bible days. The taxes were collected by Rome, for Rome, and they were collected in Judea, in Israel. So they were collected by a foreign occupying power who didn't particularly pay their tax collectors very well, so far as I can gather. And so what the tax collectors did was added an extra tax to pay for themselves. So they were particularly corrupt. They were regarded by the religious leaders, the Pharisees, as being traitors to uh, the nation of Israel. And uh, they were regarded with great suspicion by the ordinary people as uh, lining their own pockets, both of which probably were fairly accurate. And so here is this interesting picture that we have of these groups of people, and the fascinating thing is this, that they're there with the Lord Jesus. And the one word I'd love just to highlight for you, uh, you might not identify so much with the publicans, but you know, the Word of God tells us that we're all sinners, and so we fall into one or two of those categories, all of us here, the preacher very much included, but the fascinating thing is this, that they're there just because of one little word, and it's that little word I'd love just to leave with you so that you take it away. It's that little word there in verse 17, the, they that are whole have no need of the physician. 
The people that were there listening to the Lord Jesus Christ had a sense of personal need. A per- a sort of personal need. And it's that, of course, that is one of the great problems, one of the great barriers between us and God, between us and the Lord Jesus Christ. That sense that we do not have a need of him. And if we never sense a need of the Lord Jesus, we will never come to him. And isn't it fascinating that as you look at this scene in Mark chapter 2, that the people there were the people, in a sense, at the bottom. So far as the uh, opinion polls were concerned, they were at the bottom of the opinion polls. They were there with the Lord Jesus because they had a sense of need. And that is so important. It will save your soul if you have a sense of need. It will determine your destiny if you have a sense of need. It will bring you into a living relationship with God through Jesus Christ, but only if you have a sense of need. If you don't have a sense of need, you'll never get there. I remember a patient came in many years ago. Um, he's now dead, and he came in with a sore toe. <laughs> came in with a sore toe. And it was the most trivial thing you've ever seen. But he was caught up with this sore toe. And as he went out the, out the door, he turned to me and he said, oh, and by the way, he said, maybe I should just mention it. I've had a bit of bleeding. Now, we won't go into the psychology of it all, but probably that was actually in the back of his mind. It wasn't the, the sore toe at all. But he said, just forget about it. I said, no, let's have a wee look at that. The upshot of it was that his sore toe, well, he could have his sore toe forever. It doesn't really matter, but his sore toe, not much I could do about it. But the bleeding was a tumour, and the tumour resulted in an admission, and it was caught early, and he was saved. He was just about to dismiss his need of having that issue dealt with. That was the one that would have killed him. The other one wouldn't. It, wasn't, it was neither here nor there. But it's only when we see our need and have our needs addressed that we're going to make any progress. Now, let me just remind you of this interesting scene that we have here. It's so telling, isn't it, at the beginning of this little section. Verse 13, if you have your Bible, uh, let me just uh, remind you of what that says. And speaking about the Lord Jesus, it says, And he went forth again by the seaside, and all the multitude resorted to him, and he taught them the seaside. We've had a number of, of little scenes that have been set for us through Mark's Gospel. Do you remember where we've seen the Lord Jesus? Maybe places where you would expect to see the Lord Jesus. Do you remember that one of the first places we saw him was a synagogue? It was the religious place, the kind of church of the day, if you like. And we saw him there. Mind you, his presence in that religious place was really quite unique. Because, well, they, they had the rituals. But he had reality. Uh, they had their processes and their patterns, but, but he had real power. And you remember that when he came into the synagogue, there was a man demon-possessed, and the saviour, the saviour dealt with that problem. He transformed that man's life. And whilst everybody else was talking about God, the Lord Jesus Christ arrives in the midst, and he is God, and he's going to speak. Well, what, a, what an explosive experience for the people in the synagogue. They were used to hearing about God, and now they were going to hear from God. Now, that, wouldn't that be great if that happened every time the Bible was open in the Gospel Hall, and you come like anywhere else, and you come like that every time the Word of God is open, that we don't just hear about God, but that we hear from God, and he speaks to us. Well, that happened in the synagogue. I was expecting the Lord Jesus to be there, to be honest, in the synagogue. It would be, you know, the temple and that and so forth. But then do you remember, too, that the second kind of scene that we saw was, was a more intimate scene. It was that little section that we looked at last week, uh, beginning of chapter number two, verse number one. And again, he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noise that was in the house. It was just the Lord Jesus and just a few people. You had to book early to avoid disappointment uh, to, to get a glimpse of the Lord Jesus. The place was crowded out. And perhaps you remember the little thought that I dropped in just to, to, um, to point out the significance of that. that it's so important that we don't leave Jesus in the synagogue. Don't leave him there. He was there. But actually what the Saviour is interested in is not just a general presentation of who he is, but a personal living relationship with you and I. And so he's there in the home with, with ones and twos. And in fact, in that section, he deals particularly with one man, Lord, you remember, from the roof. And he gets his, his, his limbs back in order and he begins to walk. Well, the third scene is the one that we're reading here in this section here. And it's by the seaside. That's a different scene. Now, what's that about? Well, I can't help but think when I read the seaside in, in Mark's gospel and in the gospels in general, general I, I can't but help think of the fishing, you know. 
because that's where the Lord Jesus Christ calls the fishermen from, from the sea. And so often at the seaside, you'll find crowds. Uh, it's a bit like that promise the Lord Jesus Christ made to the disciples he called. You know, Just you leave your nets behind and I'll make you fishers of men. <laughs> and, and this is what we're seeing here. We're seeing the crowds coming and in a sense the net's taken out. It's a spiritual net and it's thrown wide and broad. And there's room here for absolutely everyone. This isn't just for religious people, perhaps like the synagogue. And it's not just for a few in the home. This is for us all. It's all inclusive. There is a saviour who is available to all. And he went forth, verse 13, again by the seaside, and all the multitude resorted to him, and he taught them all. There is a saviour available for all. There is a saviour who's interested in all. Some of the great Bible verses, you remember, emphasise that. John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave. We have the heart of God that is interested and moves out towards all. Come to me, all you who labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. It is an offer. It is an invitation to all. And in fact, there is provision in the Lord Jesus Christ for all. John the Baptist was mentioned, I think, in prayer earlier on. Behold the Lamb of God that beareth away the sins of the whole world. There is provision in the Lord Jesus. Now, what of course is so interesting here in these verses is that whilst this message goes out to everyone, he's a saviour who is able to save. He's a saviour who can meet our need. It's interesting, isn't it? That as we look down at this section, it is not everyone who's really interested in him. Hmm. But verse number 14, he passes by. He sees Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the seat of custom. And he said to him, follow me. And he arose and followed him. And there's the breakthrough. A man that maybe I wouldn't have expected to follow the Lord Jesus. He's, he's one of the wealthier people. He's one of the people who seems to be doing well in the system. And yet maybe there's a lesson there for us. That everything that he's got in this world, that doesn't seem to have satisfied him. And the opportunity just to get close to Jesus Christ, it's, it's worth letting go all that you have. He's probably one of the wealth, wealthiest people the Lord Jesus Christ ever called. And he leaves it behind because there's something infinitely and eternally more valuable and worthwhile in Christ than anything he ever has. Maybe we could summarise it with one of those great verses of the Bible. What shall a man give? in exchange for his own soul. What shall a man give in exchange for his own soul? I wonder how different our lives would be if we were to write the story of our life a minute after our death. I've seen a lot of nonsense on the internet over the years, people telling you how to live your life. <laughs> they haven't died yet. They don't know how you live your life. They think maybe success, that's how you live your life, you aim for that. Maybe it's wealth, you aim for that. Maybe it's work-life balance, you aim for that. Maybe it's a happy family, you aim for that. Maybe it's travel, oh, I can buy it. You know, all sorts of things. But in the light of foreverness, how ought we to live our life? And Levi seems to have got a little glimpse of that. What actually is all of this worth? in exchange for my soul. And that's a tremendous breakthrough. And the Lord Jesus Christ is invited into his home. And there are the publicans and the sinners. Verse 15, and it came to pass that as many, as Jesus sat at meeting his house, many publicans and sinners sat also together with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many, and they followed him. Now, these little verses here, in some ways, kind of turn our whole idea of what the Lord Jesus Christ is about upside down. Or at least they turn the ideas of the religious people upside down. There's a group of these religious people, Pharisees and scribes. The scribes were the scholars. They copied out the Bibles. The Pharisees were the separated ones. They were the kind of, well, they thought they were a, um, a notch above everybody else. <laughs> they were the religious people. And they had this kind of preconception that God would particularly be interested in them that God somehow would be particularly pleased with them. And if there was anybody in this world that God would have time for, it would be them. 
and suddenly their delusion is popped. <laughs> Actually, the, the, the God of heaven has, has not got time just for them. He's particularly interested in this group of people. And the second great uh, idea that this, this section pops is, is, the, is the way that we understand the whole of the Gospels, the way that we understand the ministry of the Lord Jesus. Let, 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 me, let me explain. You know, sometimes you read through the Gospels and you see all the miracles the Lord Jesus Christ did. Yeah? And you say, well, there was a man and he couldn't walk. He couldn't, he couldn't move forward in life. But the Lord Jesus Christ healed him. He saw his need and he came to the Lord Jesus Christ and the Savior put him back on his feet. Or, or there were a, there was uh, two two sisters, Mary and Martha, and they were broken hearted and they were bereaved and 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 they had lost everything and uh, and they saw the need of the Lord Jesus and they were desperate for him to come to their home and and, and the Lord Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Or what about Jairus, absolutely distraught? Uh, his daughter's dying at home and, and because of that deep need he goes out and he, 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 he takes humble pie and he seeks out the Lord Jesus and, and he sees the resurrecting power of Jesus Christ or the woman with the issue of blood or the man of the Gadarenes and they've all got their individual problems and so they come to the physician that's how he describes himself here in verse 17 they come to the physician and the leper is cured and the woman with issue of blood is cured and and the the lame is cured and the man that's born blind he gets light that shines into his life and the man that's deaf suddenly he hears and he doesn't just hear he hears from god it's great and and lives are transformed because the physician is able to heal the sick but look look at what the savior says here in verse 17 they that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. He's speaking about Levi. Levi isn't sick. He's speaking about the, uh, the sinners and the publicans. They ain't sick. This isn't a surgery he's got here. What the Savior is saying here is that his healing is primarily spiritual. And you see all of those healing miracles that run through the Gospels. They aren't just single events of people who saw their need and came to the Lord Jesus Christ for healing. They are also pictures. They apply to you and I. Because this physician here, he isn't just here to, to, to heal those who, who know they're physically sick. He's, he's there for us who are spiritually sick. He's there for us who don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. And we literally can't take and at one step tomorrow because we just don't know where to go. We, he's a saviour for us. He's a saviour for those who are utterly distraught and bereft. Uh, those who are utterly lost. Those who are walking in darkness like the blind man at the in John chapter 9 and, and the light has never penetrated into our minds and we're in this deep, dark place of emptiness and blackness. He's a saviour for that condition. He's a saviour for those that were the condition that they have never heard the voice of God. God's never spoken to them. And even if he did, well, we're deaf anyway, we ain't going to hear them. He's a saviour for that. But more than that, more than that, he's a saviour for sinners. Look at that, verse number 17. They that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick, I came not to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. The one point of confusion that sometimes arises from this verse is that some take from this that the Lord Jesus Christ is suggesting that some are righteous and some aren't. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is, you will not come to me because you think you're righteous. <laughs> you're not, you never took that invitation that came through the door, uh, half of which said, a traitor and the other half of which said sinner you wouldn't dare come with an invitation like that in your hand because you ain't you ain't a traitor and you ain't you ain't a sinner you're 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 good respectable you're a pharisee you're a, you need me as much as anybody else it's just you don't see that you need me so you ain't going to come to me that's what he's saying and if you go over to romans chapter number three you you'll see that the apostle paul proves this point that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 3, 23. He goes through uh, the, the truth of the law. And he tells us that the law isn't there to make us right before God. You don't have to stumble over many commandments before you find that you're fallen. 
You don't have to stumble over the first couple of commands before you, you realize that God isn't the most or the only important thing in your life. And you don't need to go through many commands before you realize that you've taken the Lord's name in vain or you've stolen or you've cheated and so forth. And that's not there to get us to God. It's there to tell us that we can't get to God by the law as a knowledge of sin. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Well, I've come, I've come, says the Lord Jesus, not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And that sense of need brings the sinner to the Saviour. And the greatest work the Lord Jesus Christ does, the greatest work wasn't in casting out the demons from the man of the Gadarenes. The greatest work the Lord Jesus Christ did wasn't putting the lame man back on his feet. The greatest work the Lord Jesus Christ wasn't giving the blind man his sight, although that was wonderful, or the deaf man his healing. The greatest work the Lord Jesus Christ ever do does in the Gospels, I would suggest to you, is right at the end of Luke's Gospel in chapter 23. And it's the one that perhaps gets the least attention as the most wonderful and glorious miracle of the Lord Jesus. For there on the cross is a thief dying and heading to hell. And within seconds, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, changes his destiny. Wow. Wow. He changes his destiny, not just for life. The blind man's life was changed until he died. The deaf man's life was changed until he died. Uh, Lazarus uh, uh, was raised until he died. <laughs> that man's destiny was changed forever. And that miracle is still working today in the life of that man on the cross. This day shall you be with me in paradise. And if you want to go over to Luke 15, you can check it out. Once you're there... There ain't no way into the other place, right? There's a great gulf fixed. So he's in heaven, if you like. Now let's just call it heaven for the sake of this evening. Uh, he's in heaven and he ain't going to move. That's a changed destiny forever. And that is the final and the ultimate and the most glorious work of the Lord Jesus. He has come to call not the righteous but sinners to repentance. He's the saviour of sinners. He's a saviour of sinners because he died for sinners. He suffered for sinners. His blood was shed for sinners. He ended in the grave for sinners. He didn't do any of that for any of the other miracles, but he did that for sinners. Because of that, sinners can be saved. Sinners can be moved from judgment uh, into God's eternal salvation. Their destiny can be changed from hell to heaven. And hope is theirs. What tremendous verses these are. They're verses that begin with, I think, a great sense of humility. And that's maybe where we all need to begin, isn't it? Just imagine that invitation coming to your door, you know. I'd like to invite you down to the gospel hall because you're a sinner. I don't think we'll get very many folk coming when you come. <laughs> but it begins with humility. It's the only reason anybody comes to Christ because we're a sinner. And then it begins... To change from humility to help. Wow. I've got somebody who can really deal with my problems. That's good. And it moves from help to hope. And that is the most glorious thing, surely, that comes out of this wonderful section of Mark chapter number 2. They that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. He's able to heal, and not just phys physically, but spiritually and eternally. He is able to forgive sins. Neither is there salvation in anybody else. There's no other name under heaven given amongst men whereby you must be saved. And from that wonderful work of the Lord Jesus in dying for me, a sinner at the cross of Calvary, comes eternal salvation or forgiveness. And it's his. And he gives it. You don't earn it. He gives it. And we take that step of faith as in a sense we walk away from that seaside scene and we leave the crowd behind and we go to him. He calls us. Did you notice that, by the way? I should just have emphasised that. But as you go down that little section, the one big issue that the Lord Jesus Christ presents as a source of salvation is himself. Verse 14, follow me. Follow me, verse number 14. And uh, uh, down there, of course, verse 15, they're sitting with the Lord Jesus, sat also together with, with Jesus. It is the Lord Jesus uh, who has come to seek and to save 
he's come not to call the righteous but sinners to repent and salvation is in him it's that wonderful living faith and connection with the Lord Jesus that transforms lives let's pray our Father, we do come into thy presence this afternoon with thanksgiving. We thank thee for the Lord Jesus. We thank thee, our Father, for one who's available to all. One, our Father, who made himself available to all. He moved from the, from the synagogue, from the religious place, from the small home, right there into the open air, and the crowds came. He was interested in all. And we thank thee, our Father, too, that there are those who are interested in him. We think, our Father, of that step that each of us needs to take. It's a step of humility. We see that we need him. And we thank thee, our Father, that in our need he's able to meet it. He's able to save all that come to him by faith. What wonderful hope there is in Christ. What tremendous help there is in Christ. A saviour who's able to transform not only lives, but eternity.